uh, many of, of the MCC pastors and leadership that uh, that's absolutely not true. You did see this. You did go through a, glo a global crisis and pandemic and over several years. And so I, I thought, you know, we, we have got a, a group of folks who know exactly how to navigate crisis. And so that's the reason that I sent the invitation out to try and um, start this conversation so that we can um, have that conversation with us today learning what we, we went through and how we can apply that in the, the present, um, uh, present crisis that we're going through. Uh, and, and outside of churches, even in other of our community organizations and making sure that we're able to, to share what we know and what we've learned. Um, so, so that's a little bit about what kind of stirred some of this. Uh, and I know there's a couple of articles that have, have been uh, floating around um, uh, that, that are folks reflecting on some of their time going through uh, what we saw in the, the 80s and in the uh, early 90s. Um, so again, we've got uh, joining us tonight. Again, thank you all for doing this. We, we Hopefully we'll have the, the Reverend Elder Nancy Wilson joining us here shortly. We've got the Reverend Jim Matulski, uh, who is uh, presently uh, serving as the senior minister, senior interim minister at Island uh, Church in Foster City, California. I believe I've got that right. Um, but also led MCC New York uh, along with, or as an associate pastor with Karen Ziegler uh, in the, the early 80s and then was out in Sa uh, San Francisco uh, until 2000 or 2001. And we got Reverend Karen Ziegler with us who is here in North Carolina. Uh, welcome. Uh, who uh, led through uh, some of this crisis in the New York church, uh, MCC New York, and is now uh, thankfully out there every day uh, every Tuesday specifically uh, with Tuesdays with Tillis and is, is leading that front and has been doing that now for how many months, uh, Reverend Ziegler? Three, three years. Three years, three Other years. Five weeks. Yes. Oh, goodness. So she is certainly uh, you know, out there doing that work every day. And I thank you so much for doing that. And we've got Reverend Keith Mazingo from uh, Founders MCC in Los Angeles. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and glad to, to have you back here in St. John's, although virtually. We're glad to have you back here for, for the evening. Uh, we've got Reverend Jimmy uh, Gibbs that's joining us, who has uh, been in MCC and also with UCC and was the founder of the uh, um, AIDS Community Resource Association um, back in the 80s, or one of the, the, the president and is current president for that organization, which is now called the Affordable Community uh, Residents Association. Uh, we also have Reverend uh, Steve Peters uh, with us, uh, who um, has been with MCC for a number of years and serves, I believe, as the field director for uh, our uh, AIDS ministry. Is that correct, Reverend Peters? I was that from was 80, that? 87 to 97. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we also have Jay Kelderman, who is hopping on here, who is uh, one of the founding members here at St. John's MCC and, and went through this crisis with us in, in Raleigh. Um, and serves as our lay delegate presently and, and several other things. And we have our associate pastor, Fred uh, Kennedy Kelderman, uh, Jay's husband, who is here uh, with us tonight as well to help kind of uh, uh, lead the conversation. Um, so with all of that, uh, I want to give you a chance, if you will, to just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it was, where you were at and your position specifically during the time of uh, the height of the AIDS crisis and a little bit of your experience. And we can uh, uh, start uh, wherever we want. If, if we can go in order of what I have on my screen, and we can start with uh, Reverend Karen Ziegler, if you'd like. Sure. So, uh, so I was a senior pastor of MCC New York from about uh, 78 to about 88. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the world changed forever in 1980. Um, and... I believe that what we experienced was the worst of human beings and the very, very best of human beings. Uh, and we experienced also in a kind of metaphysical way, uh, a tremendous amount of grace. And we experienced the true depth of the gifts of the LGBTQ community and really who we are as queer people. And the queer community uh, rose to the occasion in such a magnificent way, 
even as uh, there was a huge right wing backlash, even as the federal government was completely indifferent to us and in New York, the New York uh, government was completely indifferent to us. And people's parents were sending them tracks saying, you have this disease because you're being punished by God and you're gonna go to hell when you die. Um, and people believed that and they believed, they knew they were gonna die soon and they believed they were going to hell. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I mean by the best and the worst. Um, uh, I also saw people in the church and outside of the church organizing in magnificent ways to create things like the gay men's health crisis. During that time, our church played a big role in claiming the last possible building that could be the LGBTQ center in Greenwich Village. And it is now a beautiful center on 13th Street, it used to be our church home. Um, I'm very proud of that, but I also know it was the AIDS crisis that allowed us to leverage that. Um, we were looking right in the face of death every single day, our own death and the deaths of people that we loved the most. We were standing there every week, uh, feeling death all around us, and we were experiencing incredible grace. We were experiencing God uh, in a very powerful way. Hmm. So I can stop there. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, Reverend Keith Mazingo, do you want to share with us? Uh, yes. Um, also, we just got a message to make sure that we are recording. Yes, we are. I, we should okay. be. Yes, we are okay. recording. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I was um, not a pastor at the time. I was um, a school teacher. And, and, and a gay man coming out of the closet back in those days and found my way to St. John's MCC. And eventually during some of those years, I was the music director at St. John's MCC in Raleigh. And uh, so I, I can speak to this not having led as a pastor, but as, a, as a, an, a gay man trying to find his way and navigate through all of the crisis. Um, and, and actually to the point of uh, joining a group um, that was an HIV AIDS health awareness um, group out of, that was based in Chapel Hill, but I, I worked, uh, I joined them through uh, Raleigh and was able to be a volunteer to help in, in bars and, and uh, anywhere there were LGBTQ gatherings to disseminate information, to hand out condoms, uh, that kind of thing, and uh, speak with anybody who had questions about it. So I, I was in, on part of the education side of that. And then um, I guess what I want to say is that I remember most of all, uh, being the music director is the, the number of funerals that mm -hmm. we had to do and, and just being present with people and I, I had a, a unique experience that I, I will share with you. I switched jobs because I was from Goldsboro, North Carolina, which was 50 miles east of Raleigh. And at some point I was going, I had put an application to work in Wake County, which is Raleigh uh, school system. And I was extremely worried in those days about being a gay man, but I also did not want to, for it to be a surprise. I didn't, I, I wanted it to be um, them to know up front who I was. And so when I went to the interview, I was really concerned uh, until the assistant principal asked me, what, what, why, why do you want to move here? Why, why do you want to work in Wake County? And I said, well, because I'm the music director at a church here in Raleigh and I live in Goldsboro and I, I really want to be closer to my church and to the people here in Raleigh. And he said, well, which church? And I said, St. John's Metropolitan Community Church. And he thought for a minute and he said, ah, oh, the purple church on Glenwood Avenue. <laughs> and I said, yes, the purple church on Glenwood Avenue. And then I, this immediate fear came through me like, okay, this is make or break. Either he's going to say, well, this contract is no longer available or okay, fine. Um, and he said, may I shake your hand? I, I said, sure. 
why? And he said, I, I've been looking for someone from that church to say thank you to. He said, I, I'm a member of such and such Methodist church here in Raleigh. And um, I, my best friend, who was my roommate in college, we were both music majors. And after we left college, he moved to Seattle, Washington. And two years ago, he came back home to die. And I knew what that meant. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that that meant he had AIDS. And he said, as much as I love my church, my church would not have welcomed him. His church would not have welcomed him. No mm -hmm. church around here would welcome him. But your church did. And your church nurtured him and stayed with him until his last breath. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 that encouraged me. And I was like, okay, where's the contract? I'll sign it now. Um, so, uh, and, and that was the beginning of a wonderful experience there. And I, I just want to say, you're, you're absolutely right, Vance, that I, I'm not sure where we would be if it had not been for Metropolitan Community Church mm -hmm. through all of that situation. I, I really don't know. I mean, we were, there, were, there were government agencies, local government agencies that were stepping up, uh, just mm -hmm. like the one that I worked for, volunteered for. But churches, they just were not. Overall, they just were not. There were mm -hmm. very few spiritual places for people to go and find help. Mm. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and again, I know that this is tough and bringing up some memories for, for folks. Um, Reverend Jim Matulski, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you were at during the height of this crisis? Sure. I had uh, the great privilege of working with Karen. Uh, we were both children, basically, uh, at the time. Uh, in the late 70s, I started going to MCC New York. Karen became the minister of that church when she was barely 23, 24. And I became the associate minister when I was, not, uh, when I was 22 or 23. I mean, it, it, we did not have the experience to do this, but we had a calling. And uh, so my whole time in ministry uh, has been uh, in New York or San Francisco mostly uh, uh, during the AIDS era, I would say. Um, and uh, both MCC New York and MCC San Francisco were very identified with the uh, HIV community, if you will. Uh, and I have this kind of crackpot theory, but I'm going to share it with you because it's become, it keeps unfolding, which is this, that God provided for a new emergent gay community that was happening in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, provided for that group, uh, an indigenous self-determined church mm -hmm. so that uh, it would be there for the big wave of coming out that happened in, around homosexuality, particularly in the 70s in the US. And then I also believe God provided for people with HIV in the same way uh, by providing a gay and lesbian church uh, so that there would be a spiritual home already and, you know, it's a, it's a odd way to say it, but I do believe in a provident God and that we, we are not abandoned by God and that we are part of God's plan, MCC is. Um, that's why we were able to do impossible things with no resources that you can't even account for rationally, but we had uh, tremendous uh, richness spiritually. Um, and I think it's because we were we saw our Christianity through the lens of our homosexuality mm -hmm. and through feminism, and then uh, were able to see AIDS differently as a result than the way the rest of the world saw it. And the last thing I want to say, and why I was excited about this panel is, uh, I think that we brought, that we are bringing an asset for this very time, mm -hmm. our years of experience with uh, HIV, and that, that's part of God's plan in the sense that uh, that we have a gift to bring that will be of great use to our country and to the, to the world about how religion can be liberating and saving and active in people's lives rather than something that only prepares them for an afterlife. So. Thank you uh, for sharing um, again that Yes, thank you, and thank you for the work uh, that you have done. Reverend Peters, you want to tell us a bit about yourself and, and uh, where you were at during this, and, and particularly with your ministry serving uh, with the, the church uh, in the AIDS ministry? Sure. Uh, well, um, hi, everybody. It's so great to see all, 
all of my colleagues from the 80s and, and more. Uh, and um, I, uh, I was the pastor of MCC Hartford in the Northeast District uh, when I started to get sick uh, with AIDS. Uh, and uh, I, of course, we didn't know, I didn't know that it was AIDS at the time. And uh, it was 1982. So, you know, who knew? Um, but I moved to Los Angeles about that time and was uh, clergy on staff at uh, MCC in the Valley with Ken Martin, Reverend Elder Ken Martin as pastor. And um, it was there that I got really sick. And I was very sick for 1982 and 83 and a series of illnesses uh, diagnosed with GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, and then ARC, AIDS-related complex. Um, and then finally in 1984 was diagnosed with AIDS uh, and stage four lymphoma and Kaposi's sarcoma and was given eight months to live. Um, Ken Martin invited me to preach the Easter sermon two weeks later. And it was such a valuable gift to look at what it means to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as um, a person who was facing death from a stigmatized, horrible disease. And what I discovered was that if God is greater than the death of Jesus on the cross, then God is greater than AIDS. Mm -hmm. And so I bring that to what we're going through now. God is greater than the coronavirus. God is greater than COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I became the, uh, I, I got well. Uh, I mean, I was on the first experimental trial drug uh, the Suriman trials, which are now quite notorious because they killed it killed a number of people. But I was the first person to go on the drug and my cancers went into complete remission. My chaos lesions all disappeared. And I, uh, after it nearly killed me, um, I began to recover and I got well in 1987, 88 and became the director of AIDS ministry for the UFMCC denomination, um, the field director. And, um, uh, in that position, I, uh, well, bef even before that, I was writing monthly articles for our denominational magazine, uh, Journey Magazine. And I, uh, in, in, in the AIDS ministry for the denomination, I published, uh, wrote much of and published a, a newsletter called Alert, AIDS Legislation, um, AIDS Legislation, Education, Research, and Treatment. I had to remind myself. Um, <laughs> And uh, I also, uh, let's see, I, can, I don't know if you can see this, but Spiritual Strength for Survival. Um, I wrote this pamphlet very early in the, well, in the late 80s, but early in my ministry in, in, as AIDS ministry field director. And uh, this was a 10-step program uh, to help you survive and thrive with AIDS and face AIDS as, as best we could with our faith. And uh, these factors might still be, they're, they're, they're the common characteristics of long-term survivors. And this indeed, I think, could, could prove valuable now. Um, I, I, I traveled all over the UFMCC uh, preaching and teaching about AIDS and grief and, and uh, death and dying. And uh, everywhere I carried this fairy wand, or a fairy wand just like it, it is now in the Smithsonian. Um, and uh, the fairy wand I used to talk about how there are so many good fairies who were dying. And uh, it was so important, because we know that fairies die when people don't believe in them. It was so important for us to believe in ourselves and believe in each other believe enough to do the work of healing, whether it be healing into life or as it was for most people who had full-blown AIDS, healing into death. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that was the, um, the essence of, of what we were trying to do as a denomination was bring mm -hmm. hope and uh, life in the face of death. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Gibbs, do you want to share with us a bit about your uh, journey and, and uh, particularly with you uh, working directly with ACRA uh, during this time and, and as a pastor? 
Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, my esteemed colleagues as well. Um, my journey began sort of like Reverend Mazingo. Um, I started out as a volunteer. Uh, I, was, um, I was in college at the time, and I realized that there was a calling on my life, and I must answer. My best friend had been diagnosed um, with full-blown AIDS, and I became a caregiver. And that was my introduction to uh, Caregiving 101. And I was in the United Church of Christ as a deacon at my church. My church knew nothing about HIV. They knew nothing about AIDS. But I found organizations like MCC that taught me everything that I needed to know about the illness, about compassion, about care, and about what to do in crisis management. They were my go-to organization. And I thank people like, uh, um, like all the beginning folks that I met along the way. And one of those folks is on the, on the call right now. Uh, Fred's partner, Jay on the phone, um, on the call. There were people that I bumped into just like Jay who were right there by my side that gave me information that I needed uh, to care. And then in 1987, an organization that is near and dear to my heart called ACRA, we began, began with housing and supportive services for people living with HIV and AIDS. And we began housing because housing is still a necessity for people living with HIV and AIDS. And even today, after more than 30 years, we're still providing housing and supportive services. And I've always began um, knowing back even then that my calling is to help and to heal and to know that, like you said, there's something bigger out there and God is bigger than HIV. God is bigger than AIDS. And our calling even today is to do something bigger and greater and and to know that our strength comes in numbers. And those numbers came for me out of MCC. If it wasn't for MCC, I don't know where my strength would have been because there were no other organizations that formed the coalition that I needed to do the work that I, that I did back then. There were no organizations that you really could go to uh, to find the help that you needed. And as a young kid at NC State, there were no grassroots organizations back then that in North Carolina, in the Raleigh-Durham area, um, as Reverend Keith said, I mean, there were just no go-to organizations. And he was from a small town in Goldsboro, but imagine growing up in Raleigh, being born in Raleigh, there were no other organizations to go to. So I just wanted to let you know that um, being from Raleigh, being here, um, I came into the ministry a few years later, but knowing that um, MCC was my anchor and my rock, just like Jesus and God is my rock today. I really thank people like Jay who were there when I needed um, St. John's the most. Um, I thank Jay even to this day um, for allowing me into his life, the intimate part of his life, to share his story, to share the things that were very private to him so that I could better help others on their journey. Thank you. Now, with that, it's a good segue to, to let Jay tell us a little bit about himself and, and his journey here at St. John's and, and what um, uh, those days were like here in Raleigh um, for the church. So what I can remember of it, it's a long time ago, but I was I was there for the founding of St. John's in 1976 with uh, Will White and Robert Pace, who are uh, now in the Houston area. And um, I remember as the um, yeah as the the AIDS situation, if I can just call it that, developed. Um, Affecting our lives, how it was really make, making just ordinary life scary. We just did not know 
what was happening, what was going to happen. Um, and it was, it was a scary time. Uh, in the, at Willie and Robert, our, our pastor was June Norris, uh, who was, you know, a loving, caring person. She was a wonderful pastor. Uh, and I had started serving on the board already, kind of at the founding. So it was, it was a pleasure to continue on the board. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then eventually Wayne Lindsay uh, replaced her. And at that point I was no longer on the board of directors, but I had packed in 11 years by then. So it was time to do other things, but also had the pleasure of being laid down and uh, uh, serving on various committees. My personal journey with, with HIV began in 89. I clearly remember my serial conversion um, because I had the doctor and the uh, It was very short lived. Uh, and I was fine again after that. Um, but about six months later, I did uh, learn that I was positive um, having gotten a, an HIV test. So, um, but I had good health care. Uh, I live in Chapel Hill. I'm uh, a couple miles from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And uh, that was also uh, medical school there was um, my source of health care. And, uh, and I've had some, just some excellent experiences there, not only for treatment of HIV, but uh, the ongoing uh, search for, you know, vaccines and prevention. Uh, 44 years later and uh, uh, continue to serve as lay delegate. Um, I, I like to work behind the scenes. Uh, I'm kind of task oriented and I'd much rather be behind the camera than in front of it. But Well, we thank you for getting in front of the camera tonight. We certainly uh, love you dearly and are so glad that you've been here uh, all 44 years, uh, although you're only 46, I think, right? And so, yeah, so you, since a baby. So thank you for do, uh, joining us tonight and, and sharing. Uh, Fred, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into a couple of uh, questions and some, some uh, next steps for us. Well, sure. I've been at St. John's since 2000 and. Five, I believe I became a member in 2006 and I've been heavily involved ever since then. Um, just thinking back, if um, a couple of you all were children during the AIDS crisis, I must have truly been an infant at that time. Um, I was around four or five years old when, when the AIDS crisis happened. And I was thinking back, to, I've told the story at St. John several times. Uh, in my home church growing up, I can remember a Sunday morning when an individual who came in through the doors who was, as we would say then, had full-blown AIDS. Um, he walked in and the church didn't know how, how to handle the situation. Members freaked out. Um, the pastor didn't even know what to do at that time. But my mom and a couple of other of the women in the church at the time surrounded him with love. They surrounded him with support to make sure that he was taken care of. And I think back, to what I've been told of the early AIDS crisis and here, it was the women who came to the forefront. And um, so I am very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for all of you who are on the call tonight and your leadership and your guidance and wisdom over the years, because it, it keeps inspiring folks like myself and, and Pastor Vance to continue to do the work that we do every single day. We see individuals come through the doors of St. John's every single day who have issues, whether it's HIV issues, homelessness, poverty, whatever it is. We're thankful that we are there to support them. And we're thankful for all of you who have shown us support over the years as well. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Fred, for sharing that. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, a couple of uh, things, you know, and, and we may bounce around a little bit here, uh, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is some of the similarities and some of the differences that we are seeing today uh, with COVID-19 or the coronavirus uh, versus what you saw um, 
with the AIDS crisis. Uh, we certainly know uh, the AIDS crisis um, was, was a little bit slower onset, at least from a public information standpoint and things getting out there, um, and certainly impacted people in, in various ways. Um, and I think the, the first reports really didn't come out publicly until uh, early 80s, maybe in 81 or so. Um, and then early on was still very much mislabeled, uh, uh, known as a, a gay disease or a disease only affecting certain people. Um, and uh, by the end of, I think, 85, they had 20,000 known cases in the United States. And obviously that, that grew quite drastically thereafter, uh, but it impacted around the world. Uh, and there every by the end of eighty five every region of the world had at least one case. I mean this was a global crisis. Um, and so we we see ourselves today uh, again in this uh, space where almost every region of the world has been impacted by covid nineteen or or the coronavirus. Um, and here in the United States, as of this morning, I don't know what the latest numbers at four o'clock were. I didn't get a chance to check those. Uh, but I think in the United States, we had just over uh, 44,000 cases of, of confirmed uh, coronavirus with 544 deaths. And obviously, we think that we're in the infancy of this. And so we're, we're expecting to see those numbers grow astronomically. Um, so I guess from, from your perspectives, uh, if a few of you want to, to tackle that, what do you see as the major similarities of what we're seeing today with COVID-19 and, and what is uh, dissimilar, what's different than um, what we faced in the AIDS crisis? Reverend Ziegler, if you'll unmute yourself, I'm sorry. Oh, so sorry. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I would like to start this because I really want to get in a political analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected and he started to dismantle gradually the federal government and there began to be there a gradual transference of wealth from the federal government, uh, uh, you know, and the funding for the public sector into billionaires uh, and corporations. And that's been a steady stream which has greatly accelerated under Trump. So that Trump has been really dismantling the federal government very aggressively and raiding the federal treasury for corporations and billionaires very aggressively. And so what's happening now is the end result of an enormously corrupt, advanced, unregulated capitalist system where we have millions, 142 million poor people in America, a quarter of our children are food insecure. And so now with these school closings and with people ill and with what, 87 million people uninsured, um, with the failure to expand Medicaid, with, you know, uh, the just disintegration of the middle class while the rich are getting richer and richer, no affordable housing. Um, we are in the worst possible position to be facing this crisis. And one thing that we, we did and ACT UP did all the time was a political analysis so that we could connect with other activists. And just like, uh, you know, back then it was pretty much gay men. And, uh, you know, at first it was like Haitians, you know, people who were viewed as very expendable. People would just assume those people die. Uh, right now, very wealthy people are going to be kind of fine because they can buy their own respirators no problem, get their own tests, no problem. It's poor people, it's people of color, it's queer people who are gonna die and we are considered very expendable. And so we have, you know, silence equals death, <laughs> silence equals death. And we, we have to align with other organizations. There are so many of them now that are gearing up uh, to face this, to educate the public. And uh, the Poor People's Campaign is a one that I just wanna lift up because uh, I've been participating uh, with them and so have a lot of other MCC clergy and lay people. And I think it's really important that we really lean in on, on that right now. If I can add to that, I think that one thing that MCC brought from the very beginning and the beginning of uh, this virus is very much like the beginning of HIV. We didn't understand how it was uh, passed. Uh, there was a lot of prejudice, a lot of ignorance. Uh, like the kind of ignorance that our own president is exhibiting in his lack of knowledge around public health. So what distinguished MCC was uh, that we were activists as well as spiritually, or our, our faith was expressed through activism. We weren't just gonna 
uh, watch what happened. We were going to shape what happened to us. And so we developed a model of AIDS that I think will be valuable around uh, the coronavirus, which is not, we didn't do something for these poor dying people. We were the people. We self-determined. We did ministry with, not ministry to or for. And that made a huge difference in how it unfolded, I think, uh, particularly in MCC context. We were not uh, going to settle for bad religion, and we weren't going to settle for bad public health, and we held people accountable. Um, I was just reading this, rereading some essays from that period, um, one by Adrienne Rich, uh, the lesbian poet, but she says this, in the 1980s, AIDS catalyzed a new gay activism in outrage laced with mourning. And I love that phrase, outrage and mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, uh, because it, it, um, it really did guide what we did. Uh, we acted up um, and we, we just would not stand for ill treatment. You know, there was a, a Catholic church on the next block from the uh, church in the Castro district of San Francisco, where I worked for 15 years. And they had gay people there, mostly gay, but somewhat self-hating. We used to call it most homophobic redeemer because it was called most holy redeemer. And I, I'm just going to share this one phrase that we said, they did ministry to the poor dying AIDS victims. And we were the proud gay sexual men and the proud lesbians who stood by each other. And, uh, and we affirmed our, our identities as gay and sexual, not just uh, you know, downplaying that in order to be uh, saviors, you know. Um, and so our phrase was, if you won't marry us, you can't bury us. Mm. And I think it, uh, it's an insight into how our anger helped keep us alive and why we were willing to challenge the government. In 1986, California had on its state uh, ballot, a Proposition 64, which was a mandatory quarantining of people with HIV. Now, there are some differences about HIV and the coronavirus, but we have to monitor this very carefully because uh, we almost ended up with mandatory quarantining, which is something that California has done in the past um, with marginalized populations. Uh, so uh, I heard Governor Cuomo say this this morning. I just about died because I love him. He said, well, we're concentrating our testing in New York State, in New York City, because of the density of population. That makes sense. He said, basically, what we're doing is hunting positives. Uh, and I just was like, ah, you don't hunt positives. You hunt game, maybe, or something like that. But uh, the, the kind of sloppy language uh, reveals how quickly this will be uh, an epidemic in search of a scapegoat, I think. And here's where, how is MCC different? We will not participate, even if it requires us to break the law, in bad public health or bad religion. So those are just some of the things I wanted to add to what Karen was saying. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to piggyback on that some, if I may, and, and yeah. uh, say that, uh, you know, uh, silence equals death, as Karen said, and action equals life. And that's what one of the main lessons we learned in the 80s was to take action because action, uh, helplessness and hopelessness are intertwined. But when you discover there's a lot you can do politically and ministerially and in every way, then you begin to create hope. And hope is so important in facing a, a potentially life-threatening, potentially terminal disease. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to mention, too, that uh, I, I think that one of the things that was so important in the 80s was the way that women, particularly lesbian women, came to the fore in caring for us who were sick with AIDS, gay men who were sick with AIDS. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a really uh, amazing thing because when I was first sick, I, I, I couldn't find gay men anywhere uh, who would come visit me or, or um, you know, help me out in any way. It was the lesbians of De Calores MCC 
the women of De Colores MCC who, who came and cared for me and who taught me about how to be sick, how to pay attention to the, the signals of the body and what they were telling me to do. So I, I want to be sure that we lift up the women uh, of MCC who uh, really stepped forward when it was gay men who were mostly the ones getting sick. And there were women with HIV. That's important to note too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and anyway, um, COVID, uh, we must take action. We must vote uh, to get rid of this kind of corrupt government that we have. We must get out in the streets again. And it's impossible because we're self-quarantining, but we still have to get out in the streets in terms of these Zoom meetings and any other way that we can get, um, get action going. I mean, we have so much more technology today than we did back then to make a difference politically and, uh, uh, and also in terms of just reaching out to people who are sick. Um, I have four friends who are sick with this right now uh, including my doctor of the past 36 years. And uh, uh, it's really a difficult disease. It's hard to go through. And I believe in Emmanuel, which is God with us. Uh, and that means that we are called to a with us ministry. Um, we must be vigilant uh, politically, but we also must be present to each other, wherever the quality of life is at stake. It's a with us kind of ministry that we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, certainly getting out and doing some uh, more education uh, and talking about how uh, public health and the, and the crisis we're facing now ties into our voting and our being informed and, and informing other people. What are some specific actions that you would ask, one, pastors and leaders of churches or organizations today, uh, what are some specific things that they can be doing right now uh, and in the days to come? And then as a, a follow-up to that, what are some things that the church members, because I think a lot of times we, we you know, forget to say, well, here's some things that the members need to be doing as well, or the, the, the communities around us. Uh, so what are, what are the most important things you think people really should be doing right now? You know, that we went through this two generations of AIDS in the United States and didn't come out with universal, free, public health care is a scandal. You yes. know, it's one of our failures. I, I, I don't mean that to, to, to demean us, but how did we fucking go through that and not end up with free medical care as a human right, like most countries provide to varying, you know, to their capacity? That one thing alone is going to influence what happens with this epidemic. Will people access the care that they need? Will they, will they fear the economic cost? Will they fear the social stigma that may come with this? Uh, these are all things that we can influence uh, and have to be active in. We cannot go, if we end up three years from now and still don't have universal health care, you know, then we are doomed, you know, and I don't like to talk that way, but I, I do believe that, that that one issue alone, and there are many others, you know, HIV revealed social margins, sexism, racism, homophobia, anywhere where the, those kinds of dynamics were present, AIDS thrived. And I believe that uh, this virus will also function in the same way. It will reveal uh, who's, who's cared for and who's not. Uh, so being vigilant about that, uh, I think, will, will be important. Uh, being vocal, visible, informed, uh, all of these things, and bringing to it the same kind of uh, willingness to educate ourselves about things that we may not know, our willingness to talk about things that other people don't want to talk about. Uh, that was one reason people came to MCC during those years. Yeah. Sex, we talked about sex. And uh, I think that, you know, I was, you know, I've got this big pile of HIV books here. Um, and I was reading both the Susan Sontag book, AIDS and Its Metaphors, and then Final Exit also, because it's a book about 
uh, determining the, the end of your life. This has got to be something we're willing to talk about theologically and spiritually with people. Okay. And I don't mean to be a downer, but oh my God, if we don't, who will? You know, um, nothing should be off the table for us to consider uh, being informed and active and vocal about. Anybody else on some things you think we need to be doing right now uh, as leaders or as members uh, or communities? Um, I, this is on a more practical, I mean, that is the social justice side of it. Uh, you know that we have two members here at the church, Elder Larry uh, Rodriguez and his husband, Case, um, both in the hospital, both with coronavirus. I found out uh, yesterday afternoon that one of our uh, ladies here at the church um, who has been a deacon and, and served for a long time is at home in quarantine with pneumonia and has been tested. They're waiting test results. We're hoping it comes back negative. But um, what, what can we do and what's different about this than what, what we ended up learning through the years with AIDS? We know that you can get this just in the air, just being in somebody's presence just walking past someone, which is different than what we do know now about AIDS. I mean, we didn't know it at the time, but, but through the years, what we've learned through education. And one of the things that has happened, um, being as a pastor who is very hands-on, I'm very in there with them. I, you know, if you're sick, I'm gonna go crawl in the bed with you and hold you. I mean, I'm just gonna be, be present with you in that time. And we can't even get to the hospital. They want the, the hospital, is quarantine. We can't go in the hospitals. We can't go visit those people. What we do have is the technology, as Steve mentioned. And um, the other day, uh, Reverend, uh, not Reverend, uh, Elder Rodriguez and his husband have been both in isolation for two and a half weeks. They haven't seen each other. They haven't been able to talk to each other. In fact, his, his husband was um, unresponsive. They had him so heavily sedated that he couldn't even respond, even if he wanted to. Um, and so I said to Larry, because they were afraid that he was disintegrating, that his, his health was getting worse. And so uh, Larry had to sign some paperwork for him. And, and he said, I said, well, Larry, but he was like, and I can't even see him. I can't talk to him. And I said, but you, you have your phone. Maybe get the nurse to see if they will put a phone up to his ear and let him hear your voice. Well, the next thing I knew, they were calling me back and, and saying, well, the nurse one up to me. And, and she FaceTimed with, the, with his nurse and they were able to look at each other and, and he was coming out of some of the sedation and, and even though he can't speak, he was able to wiggle his fingers. And, and I will tell you that for both of them, this has made a world of difference in their own progress. I can't tell you the difference between Larry, well, I almost can measure it, the difference between Larry yesterday and Larry today. His attitude has changed. He's calling me and FaceTiming with me. And, and he can hardly talk, but he's, he's like, I can see the world again. There's an outside world outside of this shell, outside of this room. He can't even be look out a window because they're in such isolation. And so I think it's very important at this point, just as we found that it was important, um, Steve, you mentioned, it was important that those women of De Colores came and were present with you. And as we all learned better, that we could be present with one another. We could share a meal with each other. We could hug each other and kiss each other and know that it was okay. And, and now, while we can't go in the same room, it's important to find ways to, to reach out. Um, I, I'll go another step, even if it's not that dramatic. We have a long line of people that, that wait in front of our church every Saturday morning for the food bank. Uh, they're from our community. Most of them are not LGBTQ people, but they're from the community where the church is. And we did not want to shut that down, but we could not have a line of people standing I, you know, they, they will not, the, the government says you can't do that. You got to be six feet apart. So our people found a way. They, they were like, well, we can't have them come on the premises, but we can get 
up to 10 people in our courtyard and we can put bags of food together and then we can put them out front and they can just walk by and pick them up. So it's a little more work for our folks, but mm -hmm. they found a way. We have to be willing and able to find a way to reach out to people and not and, and with as little um, upset in the norm as we can. And with this isolation, I, I mean, it is so difficult to be able to do that, but we are the thinkers. We think outside of the box. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, most of us don't see Sears gave up on the box long ago. We just, <laughs> you know, we're just free for all. So we find a way, and I think it's just really important to remind people that just as we're finding a way to create worship online, just as uh, you, Vance, are learning how to work Zoom, I'm learning how to work Zoom this week myself, um, that there are things that maybe we've been putting off doing that now we're kind of forced into doing, mm -hmm. but it's good for us. Yeah. And, it, and, and I'm not sure what, what the church will look like on the other side of this, but I think it's important that people have the connections. We've got to reach out by, by phone. I've already been in touch with the staff pastors here, the volunteers that work here, to say, would you be willing to take several people to call once a week just to check in? Since we can't see each other, mm -hmm. can we call well, each other? Can we stay in line with, with in touch with each other on social media? Uh, whatever ways we can find to connect, we still have to, we have to do that. I, I think that, that the isolation is something that is very different than what it was in the AIDS years. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, you know, when I was so sick in 82 and 83, the, and I was isolated, I felt isolated, but the women who came to see me and take care of me touched me and held me. And I think a lot of us right now are going through, through touch starvation um, mm -hmm. and we need to be touched and held and, and we can't do that physically. Uh, I mean, Keith mentioned and, and I did the same thing. We would get up into the beds with people with AIDS who were dying. We would get in bed with them and hold them and reassure them and comfort them. And the, a lot of that touch was very healing, even as they died. Uh, and, uh, and we can't do that now. We have to figure out a way somehow to do that, to, 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 to feed or, or quench that, that touch starvation, you know, uh, to, so, that, so that people don't die of isolation and lack of touch and feeling. Um, I don't know how we're going to do that, but I think it's maybe one thing that we can look at as a church, as a denomination. Uh, we're risk takers. You know, we can take the risks uh, and we have to learn how to take the risks safely, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, I'm looking at the same thing as where Reverend Keith and Reverend Steve said. I mean, you know, as a chaplain, I'm used to touch. And I think that's what uh, you both were saying is we're used to touching and um, we were touching back when other congregations were passing the peace and not touching. We were touching a long time ago. We're used to touching. And what does new touch look like? What does touch look like for us now? And I think that's what Pastor Vance is saying. You know, what does, what does this all look like now? I mean, what do we do now in the face of coronavirus? What does it look like that it didn't look like when we were all facing AIDS, we touched, we were able to touch. This is a new type of generation where we can't touch, we can't breathe, we can't do anything. So there's a cure for it on the way, whereas there was no cure for HIV and AIDS. They keep saying there's a cure around the corner, but the lack of touch is really something that we hadn't anticipated. Mm. And what does it look like for us? In the, you know, I, I crawled in bed with many of my friends back in, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. And even now I've crawled in bed with many of my friends. But what does it look like now? Um, I'm just so sad to see that I can't even fathom the thought of not touching my 94 year old mother who's in a nursing home now that I haven't seen in four weeks. Um, but 
I don't know what that looks like, but I know that loneliness uh, that she's experiencing by not seeing me for four weeks is almost unbearable for her, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just as unbearable for me as well. So that's something that we're going to all have to face. And what does it look like? Yeah, that's probably been one of the most challenging things for me here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we, you know, many of you know, we, we operate a community center here. Um, and a lot of the folks that use our or make use of the center and are, are our regular guests and friends here um, don't have people that are regularly ready to touch them and to hug them and to, to welcome them with open arms. And so uh, one of the things they've gotten used to here is that, that they come here and they're, uh, we're all able to, to love on one another and experience that human connection. And so yesterday, uh, and it's happened you know, you know, multiple times, but I, I almost broke down and cried right here because there was one young lady who just really wanted a hug and needed a hug, uh, but we've, we've tried to embrace the social distancing and, and trying to do new ways of, of, uh, of caring for one another. And we, you know, we, but we both laughed. We did the foot tap or touch uh, you know, to, to bump our foot, uh, feet together to, to make it work. Um, and uh, so we're finding new ways to, to be able to create that experience and, and to share that love with one another. But it's painful at the same time because for the first time, I'm now in a place where I'm like trying to rec reconcile that with my own self that um, folks are coming here and need that human touch. And to be honest, I need it. Uh, in that moment, I realized, you know what? I get so much out of being able to, to love on folks and them being able to love me back. Um, and to, to now be in a, in a isolation uh, almost as it is uh, here. Um, so it's challenging to find new ways to be able to um, live through that and find new ways to be able to love on folks. And, and you know, that's just with, with those of us who are right now still healthy and, and aren't uh, sick with the coronavirus, um, you know, and, and certainly as, as uh, Reverend Mazingo pointed out it, we've got to find new ways to be able to reach out to those of us who are sick and those, you know, as our members and, and congregants and community get sick. Um, the other challenge that, that it's posing that's uh, unique, um, one of the, the performers um, and friends of our community in our last, uh, uh, one of our last brunches, um, a young trans woman uh, died this past week by suicide at the, the age of 21. And so now trying to plan and, and work with them to uh, figure out how to do a funeral and do a memorial in the midst of this is, is a new challenge that we're faced with. And so that's a whole nother um, way of, of trying to, to just think through what we do today. And so I, I find it challenging as I start to navigate through this to try and figure out ways to do it. And I think it's important for us to have these conversations because, uh, again, you have the experience of leading this church uh, through crisis, and, and we certainly can, can uh, glean from that information, that experience, and learn new ways together to now uh, be there for one another. Um, and, and I know we've been going for, for just over an hour, so I do want to maybe try to, to start wrapping up a little bit. Uh, this is a really big conversation, and I think uh, maybe we should, should try to schedule a follow-up conversation if that's something that all of you are, or most of you are willing to participate in, um, just because I think there's so much that we need to, to talk about and ways that we can do that. I know MCC just put out uh, a recording that happened this past weekend of a uh, ways for churches to embrace virtual uh, technology or virtual uh, um, uh, worship, uh, virtual experiences for people to be able to engage in. Um, I know one thing, uh, I think uh, you said it as well, Reverend Zingo, that you guys uh, started calling folks. And, and so we certainly uh, called our, our, our church ladies and, and got our, our uh, phone tree back up and running. And, and all of the folks who have the, um, the, the phone numbers of everybody and trying to make sure that we're just reaching out and touching base with everybody and, and letting folks know we're here if they need us. Um, we didn't really get a chance to get into this, but one of the things I wanted to, to, to uh, look at, and maybe we can do this on another call, is the ways that this is going to impact us beyond the, the illness, uh, beyond this initial phase, what this looks like in, in the coming uh, weeks and months and years. Uh, because I think you know, we've certainly already felt it here, uh, as most of you have, um, people that are losing their jobs. So here in North Carolina alone, I think last week we had over 100,000 uh, unemployment applications that came through the system, new applications. And, and that number is just going to continue to grow. 
Um, our, our next door business, uh, the brewery next door laid off 75 people, I believe, uh, this past week. And so this is hurting people. Uh, many, many of our members and congregants are, are being laid off. Many of the folks in our community center who we've helped find jobs, uh, most of them were in the service industry and restaurants and they've now uh, gotten uh, laid off. And so you know, this is really impacting people in so many ways. Um, and we have to look at this, I believe, from several angles. Um, I guess as we, we try to, to wrap up, uh, and something else I did want to point out, it, it doesn't uh, escape me, and so maybe with some more planning, we've pulled a lot of this together kind of quickly. Um, it doesn't escape me that uh, uh, I believe the only panelist that is presently on the call uh, uh, that is female is Karen Ziegler. Um, uh, yeah, 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 unmute yourself, if you will, Reverend Ziegler. Um, okay. Can I just stop you for just a minute? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so as you're talking about all of this uh, and all the unemployment and everything, I find myself getting really anxious. Mm -hmm. We're going into a really, really difficult time. And so what I have found is that there are moments that we just have to stop. We have to stop talking about the bad news. We have to stop talking about all the horrible stuff that's going on. We have to stop watching the news and we have to breathe and recognize I am feeling really anxious. My heart is racing. I'm tightening my body. And so I just want to invite all of us on this call in case anyone was feeling anxious as all of this was being mm -hmm. said to please breathe. Yes. Um, and that's going to help us get through. Remember, you know, ruach, Hebrew word, breath. Um, the Greek word for breath, they're both the, also the word for spirit. We have to, and this is something activists are writing about, when we gather together, we have to breathe together. That's why we sing together, so that we can breathe together and harmonize our bodies because we have to metabolize all of this trauma. All of us are living in so much trauma and now we're all being re-traumatized. So we have to stop and we have to breathe. And that's what we need to do when we come together. Yes. Um, and, and I think leading, leading each other in that kind of pause and compassion for ourselves and self-care. Mm -hmm. You know, someone said, it feels like the universe has sent us all to our rooms to contemplate what we've done to the planet, to, you know, how unsustainable our culture is. You know, just one more thing is we're queer, you know, we're queer. And what that means is we can see things that other people can't see. It's a genius. That's why we've led every single rights movement that happens on this planet. We're queer and we have to be as queer as we possibly can. And we have to fiercely love and then we have to most of all take care of ourselves. I love you that you're waving your fairy wand, my dear friend. Okay, I'm going to stop. No, thank you. And, and that, you know, one of the things I think that we have to recognize, um, one, it's that self-care component. I think that's the most important part. And it's going to be extremely difficult right now to make sure that we have time for ourselves. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to point out is, uh, I think, something that a few of you have already mentioned, um, that it was the women, I've heard this so many times, that it was the women who led and cared for MCC and got us through uh, the AIDS crisis. Um, and it uh, doesn't escape me that, that uh, Reverend Ziegler, you're the only female on the call right now that I'm aware of. And so um, we certainly have to be intentional about honoring that. May I, may I make a point too that uh, as far as I know, Reverend Cecilia Eggleston is the only non-US person on, in on this as well. And yes. we need to be conscious that this is a global pandemic. Yes, yes. absolutely. Now, Vance, I hope that we will be able to get back together. I know that even with the list of questions you had us to look at ahead of time, we've not gone through all of that and we do need to, and it's that important. And it's important to realize that as a denomination, um, Karen and, and um, Jim both can, uh, Jim uh, Matulski can both speak to this. Uh, much better than I can, but we lost half of our male ministers in our denomination back in the 80s. And also, I, I remember very well, Jim, uh, when you were in San Francisco, uh, you were just talking about self-care, Karen. 
um, and how important that is with us because I remember you talking about doing 500 funerals in one year and, mm -hmm. and I can't even imagine and I worked at a funeral home. I don't think 500 while I was working there. Um, maybe we did and I just wasn't counting, but I, I'm just thinking, you know, if the worst is yet to come, we've been very blessed with, with the ones that we have at the moment, but if the worst is yet to come, we as ministers may be, may be doing some of these funerals in home churches or being called to go to the funeral homes and do funerals for people where other ministers won't go. And, and are we willing and, and, and how, do, how do we navigate through this particular situation? I did a wedding, by the way, through Zoom the other day. So oh, wow. um, I, there are ways that we can do it and we can still be present, even if we're not touching. Just mm -hmm. want to make us aware that we do have to take care of ourselves. So, Karen, you are absolutely right. Um, for two weeks, I would wake up all during the night and I thought I was having a heart attack. And, and th but I didn't have the real, real symptoms of heart attack. So I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense. And it was really just the pressure, just the pressure of all of the anxiety going on around us and not knowing what to do next. Mm -hmm. But we have to find a way to do what's next. Yes. Well, we have a tool that not everyone makes, uh, uses, or at least in healthy ways. We make theology, we make meaning out of things. You know, I'm thinking of this uh, book that Letty Russell wrote about the visit of the National Council of Churches to MCC San Francisco. And for the first time, most of those people heard actual people with HIV talking, yeah. not people talking about people with HIV. So yeah. I, I just say that because I think there's a theological point we have to bring up as often as we can. We have a future. We don't, yes. we, we don't know what it is, but every time I'm speaking to my church in Boston City, I remind them we have a future. You know, we believe in the life to come. We believe that healing is ha is possible. These aren't things that the people are saying theologically yet about how to survive this crisis over a long period of time. But we do have this as a resource. We believe that we are able to. Yes. Meaning. And so uh, this is my pitch to you. Talk about the future. Not in unrealistic or denial ways, but uh, in ways that uh, help people see beyond what they're not able to see yet. It is the season of resurrection. Yes. Yes. Bring hope where there is hopelessness. Yes. Yes. Bring hope. Yes. yes. Well, thank you all. Um, we, you know, resonating uh, with, with what the comments have been here, we will get through this together. Um, we, we certainly will get through this. Um, and we'll do that by doing exactly what we're doing here, having these conversations. Um, Reverend Cecilia Eggleston did, uh, or our moderator, uh, Reverend Cecilia Eggleston, uh, did mention in the comment section for those watching uh, that there are going to be more webinars coming on uh, pastoral care and then on mental health, so be watching for those. Um, and I will certainly, you know, coordinate with folks and see if we can put together more of these to continue having these conversations. I believe there's interest in it. I think people are willing to do that. Um, and I'm certainly willing to help in whatever ways I can continue the, the conversation. Um, we will have a, a, a recording of this video posted on the St. John's website. Uh, you can get to that at stjohnsmcc.org. Um, I believe they will, will probably share it out from, from some of the denominational means as well. Um, and then we'll be putting some notes together from this call so that we can share those with folks and, and feel free to share it as many places as you need. Like I said, I think this is a time where MCC can truly lead uh, other churches, other communities, and other organizations, regardless of our faith, and even other, uh, other faith communities, um, through this crisis because of our history and because of our experiences. And so this is a time for us to be able to step into the role that I believe we have been called into uh, to be able to lead uh, folks around the world uh, through uh, this crisis. Um, so we'll make sure we get those up. Um, Reverend uh, Elder uh, uh, Cecilia, do you have uh, anything that you would like to, to share before we conclude the call and, and close in prayer? Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone. This has just been very inspiring uh, for those of us that uh, perhaps were coming into MCC. Certainly that was my experience. Uh, the first wave of HIV and AIDS hit and then I came into MCC. So it was... Um, 
hearing about it. You know, people like uh, you, Jim, were these mythical heroes that, you know, we heard about and, you know, pastoring MCC San Francisco. And um, so it was very powerful and poignant to hear those stories. I think there's a wonderful piece, you know, you know, we look around the screen and I'm not on screen, but, uh, you know, we are speaking from a place of experience. And what's heartening is to hear Karen and, and Jim talk about how young uh -oh. oh goodness i think i just uh we're trying to move her to a, a, a panelist where she could actually be seen and i think i have uh, done something wrong i told you i'm learning this there you uh, go she's she's there there we go. Go. all right i can i'll put my video on and then you can see me how would that be there, there we you go. are Thank fantastic you. <laughs> there you go yes so <laughs> well done mcc pastors not quite sure who you are but you're very enthusiastic um yes so to hear about youth, young people, you know, somebody mentioned about children uh, and them having a voice, you know, uh, how do we support our young people to be imaginative and daring uh, and do great things? Uh, how do we connect in different ways? I, I love the story that you uh, told us, Keith, about, you know, uh, Larry and Keys, but also how to keep doing the ministry, you know, it's like we can still uh, feed people, we can still pray with people and, and do some of the old fashioned things, you know, writing cards, sending cards by the post. You know, I always say you can't put a, you can't put uh, an email on the mantelpiece, you know, mm. so to actually physically send cards to people, something that they can keep going back to. So there's all sorts of things that we can do. I think the, the dialogue about, what will church be like after this? You know, what, what will people have gained from this time? Because the conversations around the time of the greatest suffering and the greatest loss, the passion with which you all talked and the conviction that you had that we grew in this, we, we had powerful things to say powerful things that we did even in times of great loss and you know that has helped us and has made us uh, better people of faith better communities uh, better activists so it's all of those different things so this could have been a very uh, downbeat conversation and instead you know I feel very inspired I feel very grateful to all of you for sharing your story but I know you know, there are so many pastors and members of congregations that are listening on this call who are already doing the wonderful things that you describe that you did in, in those great times. And, you know, it is a different day in so many ways, but loneliness, isolation, you know, they were the same then. And, and we need to find those new ways of touching, however that can be done and done well. So thank you to all of you. And thank you to everybody who's uh, who's not on screen, who I know is, is really working hard to do great things. And, uh, you know, God will bless us in this time. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I do want to point out that uh, Reverend Elder Nancy Wilson did message in. She had uh, internet crash in her entire complex, she said, just wow. before this happened. So she did end up popping in on Facebook Live and, and watching some of it there. So uh, maybe we can join her into some future conversations as we continue this. Uh, thank you again, Madam Moderator, for, for you know, leading us uh, in and through this time and for setting up some of the future um, webinars that are going to happen. I think you were mentioning that will we'll help. Uh, us as pastors and us as, as people of faith just try to find new ways to navigate um, in these, these times. So uh, thank you again to everybody for taking time to be here tonight. Um, we certainly appreciate your, your hard work uh, for, and your years of dedication and commitment that got us to where we are today that set us up to be able to be this people today, uh, to be able to, to lead uh, as we continue through um, this current crisis that we're in. And uh, with that, uh, if there's nothing else, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Fred, if you will, to, to have a word of prayer with us as we, we face the days ahead. And I'll be in touch with folks again to, to set up some other conversations um, in coordination with the domination as well. Sure. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Creator, in moments like this, we stop and pause 
to give you thanks. Even in the midst of a global pandemic, we stop to give you thanks. Because in times like these, we are called to come together as a community. Even from distances, we can still love on each other. While we might not be able to physically touch, we know that your presence is there. God, we thank you for technology. We thank you for creative ways that we can make, remain in contact with each other. We thank you, God, for metropolitan community churches. We thank you, God, for Reverend Elder Troy Perry. We thank you, God, for the vision that you gave him to start this global movement. We thank you, God, for all those who have led the past over the years. We thank you, God, for all that you have allowed us to go through, to live through, to give us strength for the journeys and the days that are coming. We ask God that as we continue to go through this pandemic as a, as a nation and as a world, that you will continue to lead us and to guide us. Because God, we know that with you, all things are possible. This morning, this evening, God, we thank you. And God, we ask that you would be with all those who are going through mental crises in particular. Because God, we know that being in isolation is never good. But when you have a mental illness, God, we know it can be troubling and traumatic. And so God, we lift up all those who are going through. This morning, this evening, God, we lift up all those who are quarantined, all those who are isolated, all those who are in various hospitals, God. And God, we lift up all those healthcare workers who have been taxed with taking care of, of the sick. We ask God that you will be with their families. We ask God that you will be with us all in these days coming ahead. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Fred. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you for those who have watched online and those who will watch. Again, we'll be posting some additional information, so stay tuned for that. Uh, stay safe, know that we love you. Call somebody, write somebody, I love that. Uh, Reverend uh, Elder Cecilia, that the, we need to write people. We need to send cards and thank yous, um, and, and we love yous. So do that. Love on people. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. I love you, and I will talk to you all very soon.